Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us at our latest edition of the New Strategies at the Breast Center. The New Strategies series is a way for those who are interested to hear from leading physicians and researchers about exciting advances, unmet needs, and how they're being addressed through new approaches to research uh, and clinical care. Next slide, please. I'm Leif Ellison. I'm the program director of breast medical oncology at the Mass General Cancer Center and the clinical director of breast and ovarian cancer genetics. Next, please. So sometimes people ask me, what makes Mass General unique? Uh, and I think if it were one thing that I could point to above all, it's the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of the care that we give. And that's particularly true in the breast center, where here you can see that we have an integrated team for patient care and research uh, involving breast radiology, medical oncology, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology. Uh, and on top of that, we have all of the different aspects that are important to the best patient experience and to advancing the research that will improve care, including patient education and outreach, including survivorship, because we have so many breast cancer survivors now, palliative care, and basic research to drive the next generation of advances. And all of this is brought together at, under one roof uh, at Mass General. First, a few housekeeping issues about our webinar today. Um, no microphone or video capabilities are needed to participate. At any point during the webinar, uh, you are able to ask questions using the Q&A feature, which is usually at the bottom of your screen. You can, you can list your name or you can ask questions anonymously. Please keep your questions as brief as possible. Um, questions will all be addressed and we've left plenty of time for discussion and answering of the questions that you may have at the end of all the presentations. Uh, in addition, the webinar will be recorded and a shareable link will be provided after the event uh, for those who are interested in hearing it again or those who perhaps were unable to attend. So this slide you see gives you kind of an overview about the network uh, of care and research that we provide. And I thought to start, I would just give you um, a sampling of some of the really truly clinical practice changing uh, advances that have been made in breast cancer just in the last couple of years led by teams at Mass General. Next slide, please. So on the upper left, we know that in the breast cancer subtypes, triple negative breast cancer is among the most aggressive and Aditya Bardia in the center uh, published these two papers in the New England Journal of Medicine in the past couple of years, leading to the FDA approval of an entirely new class of precision medicine called Sasituzumab govidekin that has doubled the overall survival of women with advanced triple negative breast cancer. Truly a paradigm changing therapy for this disease. The entire program from its inception, including the first in man studies of the agent were led by Aditya uh, in, the, in the breast center. On the right hand side of the top, you see uh, one of the most advanced and molecularly targeted drugs for breast cancer um, called alpelisib for a certain type of mutant uh, breast cancer that's hormone receptor positive. This also led from the very earliest stages by Dan Urich uh, in the breast center, FDA approved in 2019 as a result of his research. And most recently at the bottom, uh, Dennis DeGroy, um, the chief of breast pathology has led over almost 15 years uh, an effort to understand through the molecular makeup of tumors uh, how best to treat them in the setting of hormone receptor positive breast cancer and recently reported that one of these tests called the breast cancer index, a sophisticated molecular test, is able to determine which women can benefit from extending hormonal therapy. This is a test that's now in the national clinical practice guidelines. It was recently approved uh, by Medicare uh, because up to 25% of women can be identified to benefit from this new and extended approach to hormonal therapy. Just some of the recent examples of how practice is being changed through research that we've led. Next slide, please. So today's topic is really focused on the issues of screening, breast cancer risk assessment, and breast cancer prevention. 
And we have two world leading experts in these topics whom you'll hear from today. First, Dr. Connie Lehman, who is Director of the Division of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Avon Foundation Comprehensive Breast Evaluation Center. Connie is one of the national and world leaders in breast imaging, not only for cancer detection, but as you will hear, uh, for developing new ways to assess breast cancer risk through imaging. After hearing from Connie, you will hear from Dr. Michelle Specht, an expert surgical oncologist who has pioneered um, important approaches to better not only the disease specific outcomes, but also the cosmetic outcomes from breast cancer surgery. So to set the stage for this discussion about screening, risk assessment, and prevention, I wanted to give you one vignette from our multidisciplinary research program that is in its early stages in terms of research, but I think is giving you a view to how we're trying to really push the frontiers. And this is the study that we did together uh, with Michelle Specht, focusing on women who were at the highest risk of breast cancer. These, those who carry mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes currently to prevent their breast cancers entirely, um, the major approach that can be used is prophylactic mastectomy. We launched uh, now an international research collaboration to understand the earliest steps in the uh, genesis of these breast cancers that might lead us to new approaches to prevention. And that's shown at the top where we have a scheme for analyzing the tissues with the consent and partnership of women who undergo this surgery, analyzing the tissues in a very sophisticated way. At the bottom left, you see what are, is the entire genome or molecular makeup of these normal breast tissues from women who undergo this preventive surgery. And what we found is that at the earliest stages, there are actually major chromosomal defects in the tissue, even when it still looks normal under the microscope. And the same was true with expression of genes shown on the bottom right. And what this told us was that these cells have a particular defect that was previously unrecognized and that this defect might be associated with the liability of these cells. And so now through a large research collaboration, we're trying to understand that liability. We're trying to use these genetic changes as a marker of risk in these patients and trying to use the liability as future approaches to preventing breast cancer. So hopefully in the future, these women don't have to face the choice of undergoing surgery. So this is early in its genesis, but certainly promising and exemplary of the kind of work that we're doing in a multidisciplinary manner with the partnership of the investigators and patients. And now I'd like to turn over the floor to Connie Lehman, Director of Breast Imaging. Thanks so much, Leif, and welcome everyone to our afternoon session. Um, I'm gonna be speaking and sharing with you some research that I'm just incredibly excited about. Um, it's in the domain of artificial intelligence and health, and specifically in my area of expertise in breast imaging. And I really want to share the work that we're doing and demonstrate how it's really been a roadmap that we've built to change the breast cancer screening paradigm. So the next slide. Our screening paradigm goes back to the 1950s. It's really amazing to think about how long we've been doing screening mammography in the US and other countries. Every year, 200,000 or 2 million women are diagnosed with breast cancer globally. And every year globally, 600,000 women die from breast cancer. Most of these women we can't identify as being at risk for breast cancer. They don't have any known risk factors. And that, that simple fact alone, that the vast majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer have no identified risk factors, pushes us to look at this in a different way. These three women in the top left-hand corner of the collection of photos, those are the types of women that were in the early studies around breast cancer. Certainly all of the women that participate in these studies were white. Um, all of the models that I'm going to present to you that are traditional risk models were developed almost exclusively in white women. And so we have some work to do because the impact of breast cancer is global and we're looking for more accurate, more equitable, and also feasible risk assessment models available to the full diversity and the full and the large populations of women impacted by this disease. So the next slide. Um, if I stay back in history for a little bit, uh, 
Mitch Gale is an amazing investigator, and he was really um, the father of many, much of this early research. And I respect him so much for, in his first paper that he published in 1989, being very clear about the limitation of the work that they were doing to predict a woman's future risk of breast cancer. I mean, let's just read the title together. Projecting individualized probabilities of developing breast cancer for white females who are being examined an annually. He knew that he was not developing a model for women of color, for our patients who are African-American, Black, Hispanic, Asian, Pacific Islanders, and that has haunted us since 1989. To his credit, um, 25 years later, he wrote a beautiful commentary and he said, we need stronger risk factors to be discovered. And he also pointed out that these risk factors need to be equitable and service the full diversity of patients at risk for this disease. Some of the research I'm gonna be showing you, I'll refer to a term called area under the curve or AUC. This is a, a metric, a measurement that we use to see how well a test is performing. Is it um, sensitive? If it says the disease is there, is there actually disease there? And is it specific? Um, if it doesn't just call everyone diseased or everyone at risk for breast cancer in this case. And we then generate this curve and we look at the area. So you can imagine if you had an AUC of 0.5 or 50%, it's a flip of the coin. It's right half the time and it's wrong half the time. And um, the AUCs of our traditional approaches to assessing risk have hovered in the 0.6 to 0.65 for a very long time. And you know, at best we refer to this as, as moderate uh, performance. And so we knew we needed to do more. So the next slide. So I was so excited when I had the good fortune to meet a woman who had actually gone through her own breast cancer treatment at Mass General. And she also happened to be a computer scientist at MIT, just across the bridge. And she and I had coffee together and she thought, can't we apply AI to mammography, to the field of breast imaging? What could we do together? And as we talked and I shared with her as a breast imager, what I'm able to see just with my human eyes and my human brain um, in a mammogram, I shared more what story is in every woman's um, breast. So if you look at these mammograms that I've selected, they all look different. Just the way before when I shared the faces, all those women, you could identify them as different from each other. When you've been studying mammograms for a long time, you can start to see that just the way every woman has her own face or her own thumbprint. She also has a very unique mammogram that is unique to her. In fact, if ever there's errors made and the wrong mammogram is stamped with someone else's name, almost invariably the radiologist in comparing to prior years is gonna say, there's something wrong. This isn't the same patient. And what are the stories that are told in a woman's breast? Well, lots of studies have been done. We know stories are told if she's gained or lost weight. And this is a risk factor for breast cancer. We know if she's started hormones or if there's been a really significant change in her hormonal profile. If she's gone on a preventative medication such as tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor, we can see those changes um, in the x-ray. Sometimes they're subtle, but you know, good experts that look at changes over time can pick this up. We can see if she's had prior breast biopsies, which is also a risk factor. We can tell if she has a personal history of breast cancer. Has she had radiation? Was it likely that the lymph nodes were involved? So these cues are in every screening mammogram. And yet all we've been doing for literally over 60 years is assessing the woman's breast density and whether or not we can see a cancer. And there's so much more data here. So we developed a deep learning model to extract the full spectrum of digital signals embedded in each individual woman's mammogram. And we weren't telling the computer what to look for. We were teaching the computer to find the signals that would predict this is a woman who's going to develop breast cancer in the future as distinct from this mammogram and this woman is in a woman highly unlikely to develop breast cancer in the future. So the next slide. So people are getting so sophisticated about artificial intelligence. I find that sometimes I, I skip through too quickly how we actually built the model. Um, you may have seen some of the early artificial intelligence and computer vision products where they would give 
very fast computers, lots of pictures, maybe lots of pictures of cats and dogs. And then they would label all of those images. And through neural networks, as I have a little sketch on the top of the um, slide here, shows the images are fed through all these neural networks. And the more images with the labels of cat or dog that are fed through, the smarter the machine gets. And pretty soon you give the machine a, a new image of a cat that might be rolled up in a corner or hanging upside down. And that computer has seen so many diverse images of cats labeled as cat um, that they can say, well, that, well, that's a picture of a cat. So we did the same thing with mammograms, but instead of you know cat dog, we labeled the mammograms knowing the future outcome of that patient. So this is a mammogram where the woman developed breast cancer in five years. This is a mammogram where the woman never developed breast cancer. And we provided our um, very fast computers with almost a quarter of a million mammograms and over 80,000 patients. And a very standard process in model development is you take a training set, that's where you want most of your images to be. We had about 210,000 and you train the model again and again, telling it this was cancer, this was not cancer. And then you hold out a test set so that you can test it and make some fine tuning adjustments and then an important part is you have a validation set that the computer has never seen to see how did that perform. This internal validation was a really important final step. That's how we developed our model. But then importantly, we're also going to do the next step of external validation. So the next slide. So uh, we recently published um, our not only internal validation and development of the model from Mass General, our most current model, but also validation at global sites around the world. To date, we've validated this at six different sites from Brazil to Atlanta to China um, and other um, very diverse patient populations. We wanted to avoid writing a paper about this is what we did in a large group of white women in Boston. So um, what we found was our AI image only model performed better than traditional models. And it also supports equity across races. So what this is showing us are the three groups of patients, white and the middle group is Asian and the far left, the far right is um, African-American or black. The blue bar is the um, considered one of the strongest uh, traditional risk scores, which is a tire acoustic version eight, which interestingly includes density, but not other factors. And then the turquoise is our model. So the, our performance um, of our assessment of tire acoustic in white women was exactly what many, many other investigators had reported, which was an AUC of 0.64. Um, others had also reported much lower rates in Asian and African-American women, but our AI model performed consistently higher um, compared to tire acoustic and also consistently higher across all races. Uh, next slide. So that's what we've done. Now, the really exciting um, part was we've been able, because at Mass General Brigham, we have one unified radiology platform. All of the images are in one center. We have um, ability, therefore, to, as we've developed a clinical infrastructure, to deploy our AI model. We're still in the research investigation part of this, but we are all set up to flip the switch when we're ready to clinical deployment, not only at Mass General, but across all of Mass General Brigham. And that work is going to help us, we believe, provide more equitable, um, more feasible, more accessible, and more accurate risk assessment for the full diversity of patients within our MGB system. So we're really excited about that. Of course, we have lots and lots of AI tools that we've developed from this very large database. And at the end of the day, all of these tools that we have, what they're going to do is help humans do their jobs better. Um, we can choose how to, how to use these and implement these for good. We see lots of stories of AI being used for not great purposes and how lucky are we in health to use this to really improve the lives of our patients. So we also, in another domain with our AI tools, we see a roadmap for eventual autonomous interpretation of screen mammograms. So exciting that this screening mammography tool, which is only available to a select group of women worldwide, could actually be expanded to the full um, global population of women because you remove one of the most critical elements, which is high quality breast imagers to interpret the mammogram. 
But you know what? Machines can help us here. They've done it in other areas. They help us evaluate blood cells in ways that hematologists used to have to do. So we can make this transition. We're going to do it through really careful science and really thoughtful implementation. So the next slide. So that's the work we've been doing in imaging and AI. It's sort of fun to think about because when Regina and I first started talking, I was then talking with Michelle Specht and we were thinking about like, how can we use these AI tools? Like anytime you have something you wanna predict the future on, let's think about, do we have the data sets with the known outcomes to, to develop models to do better than we've been able to, to do um, without these fast computers? And uh, it's that synergy, it's that integration um, being you know, side by side in the Avon Center with Michelle um, that really has helped us have these innovations and um, really exciting areas. So now I'm going to turn it over and introduce my um, very good friend, the co-director of the Avon Center um, and just outstanding uh, scientist and surgeon, uh, Dr. Michelle Speck. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, and thank you, Leif. This is a terrific opportunity to kind of really demonstrate um, how collaborative we are. Um, I thought I would begin by just showing you our really world cross team of both breast imagers and breast surgeons. And I, you know, I can't say enough that we truly work together. Um, if you look at the picture in the middle, that's the front door of the Avon Breast Center. And it's really in this physical space that we, we work elbow to elbow caring for patients, um, which is really terrific. And, Thinking about expanding our access to patients throughout the area, we also are proud of the fact that we have both screening and diagnostic centers and breast surgery centers that have the same integrated model at many sites beyond our Boston campus. And Connie and I are very passionate about making sure that we can deliver the high level of care that we can provide folks in Boston um, to folks all over the region. Next slide. But as Connie did such an incredible job trying, you know, identifying those who are at higher risk for getting a breast cancer, we really started to strategize about what do we do with that information? Um, and I know many of you have come to the Avon Breast Center um, worried about your risk of breast cancer, whether it be because of family history, um, and then said, well, what am I going to do about it? Thanks for telling me, but what's the next step? And so um, another friend of ours, Dr. Beth Frades, is a life medicine physician um, at the MGH. Um, and she has a program um, that really focuses on lifestyle medicine. And so Connie and I and Beth strategized and applied for a grant through the, what's called the Frigoletto Program. This is a committee um, which is focused on physician well-being at the hospital. Um, but we thought that we could get a twofer out of the deal. We could use Beth's expertise to produce 12 videos that would help outline a pathway to wellness and hopefully address some of those prevention strategies to prevent breast cancer for our patients. Um, but try it out on our own faculty. Um, looking at that slide that I had before with that diverse group of faculty, we all needed wellness and we could all certainly benefit um, from best education. Next slide. And so just to give you a little background, when we think what are the steps that we know that a woman could take to reduce their risk of breast cancer, um, there are three that we focus quite a bit on nowadays. Hopefully as we garner more data um, and expand our understanding, we'll have more to add to the list. But for now, we're very much focused on getting to and staying at a healthy weight, making sure that you incorporate activity and fitness into your day. And if you drink alcohol, trying to drink in moderation. Next slide. Now, why would body fat and breast cancer risk go hand in hand? We know based on lots of studies that were performed that excessive body fat is a factor linked to increased risk for postmenopausal breast cancer which may be due to the fact that fat tissue is rich in an enzyme called aromatase. In fact, aromatase inhibitors are one of the mechanisms that we use for patients diagnosed with breast cancer or who are at, at high risk for breast cancer to prevent a breast cancer chemically. This enzyme converts precursors in the body to estrogen and keeping the hormone in circulation 
even when ovarian production stops at menopause. There's also an idea that perhaps an increase in inflammation associated with increased body fat may play a role in breast cancer development. Next slide. In addition to that, we know that many studies are now showing that women who engage in regular exercise have a lower risk of developing a breast cancer. In fact, you could reduce your risk of breast cancer by 20 to 30% by just getting four to five hours of weekly exercise. It could be anything from gardening to running, all types of physical activity can reduce both the risk of premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer. Next slide. And this may be due to a number of factors. We know that muscle fibers increase the release of myokines, which are um, mechanisms to induce cell death in breast cancer cells and colon cancer cells, respectively. In addition, we know that exercise training seems to prepare the tumor environment better so that our own body's immune system, which include natural killer cells, may help mitigate the risk of developing a breast cancer. And finally, when we think about alcohol and breast cancer risks, next slide, please. Research shows that drinking alcoholic beverages increases a woman's risk of hormone receptor breast cancer in both the pre and postmenopausal women. This may be due to increased levels of estrogen um, due to a differential metabolism of estrogen in the liver in someone who drinks more than that um, and other hormones that are associated with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Alcohol may also increase the risk of breast cancer by damaging DNA in the cells. Next slide. And so it's recommended that women limit their alcohol consumption to three to five drinks per week. And women with a history of breast cancer should also try to limit alcohol consumption as well. Next slide. So with this data in hand and Dr. Frady's expertise in what she calls paving the pathway to wellness by taking a little survey of yourself and seeing what areas in the wheel of that pathway you need to work on, and then watching videos, engaging in training, um, and then taking advantage of where we live. Um, the fact that the Avon Center lives in the MGH building is terrific, because um, as you all know, we have leaders in the field of weight loss. So the MGH White Center treatment programs have engaged with us to help patients who are at highest risk and having trouble losing their body mass um, to help strategize ways to prevent breast cancer. We also know that our psychiatry department is world renowned in their ability to understand the pharmacology of both alcohol and opioid disorders and may help us in terms of engagement. And then finally, areas of exercise physiology in order to help maximize our ability um, to be active on a daily basis. Next slide. But some risk factors are not modifiable. And uh, Dr. Ellison alluded this previously. There are some women with very strong family history of breast cancer, patients with a genetic mutation. And until Dr. Ellison has that magic bullet based on his research, there are women who choose surgery as a mechanism to reduce their risk of, bilateral, of, of breast cancer by undergoing a bilateral mastectomy. We in the Division of Surgical Oncology really seek to innovate in order to improve the experience of those who are, um, choose this decision, both in the way that we do the surgery and in the process of going through it. Next slide. Risk-reducing mastectomy is certainly an effective mechanism to prevent breast cancer. Our latest research demonstrate that bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy can reduce a woman's risk of developing a breast cancer to less than 1% likelihood. However, it does come with a significant psychological and physical impact. And so therefore, my team, who has one of the largest experience in terms of doing this surgery in the country, have really learned to help talk women through this process and understand the risks and benefits associated with such an operation. It's really through a thorough review of the limitations and benefits of the operation itself that actually translates into better satisfaction after the surgery. But remember, this is one of the hardest decisions that women will make in their lifetime. 
Next slide. We've worked with our plastic surgery colleagues in order to create an operation in which women may undergo bilateral mastectomies for risk reduction, but then able to get the implant-based reconstruction at the same operation. Um, this allows folks to get back to work, get back to their normal life in a speedier way, and also avoids unnecessary surgeries. Next slide. Once we had developed the program to be able to do the immediate breast reconstruction, we wanted to take it a step further and ask the question, do women really need narcotics after breast reconstruction? Is this an operation um, that could lead to further problems down the road because of opiate use? And so this is a study that we published back in 2019 where we were able to compare patients we treated in 2010 to those that we treated in a more um, contemporary cohort, that being between 2016 and 2018. In this study, we demonstrated that the use of IV opioids in the recovery room dramatically dropped throughout all the patients that we operated on who were having mastectomy with reconstruction, including those with cancer. The time to their last dose of receiving an IV narcotic was dramatically reduced and the length of stay was reduced as well. So as of the time period of 2016, 2018, our length of stay landed about 27 hours. So just most patients were staying over just one night. And then, next slide, we decided to take a, a step further. Um, the story came about that I have a husband who's an orthopedic surgeon who does hip and knee replacements. And he was talking about sending patients home after a hip and knee replacement. And I wondered based on our prior study, why couldn't we send someone home after a mastectomy with reconstruction the same way? And so I worked with our nursing teams, our plastic surgery colleagues, our anesthesiologists, again, reiterating the really amazing ability to create such a programs at our multidisciplinary um, a hospital to develop a program. And so we developed this program at the end of 2019 into early 2020 and didn't realize how dramatic um, the results would be. And so it was a program where we gave a lot of education, created videos where patients could understand what it was gonna be like post-operatively and what they would need to do to manage drains um, and such. Um, we had each patient receive a block at the time of their mastectomy. A block allows us to minimize nausea and vomiting after surgery and minimize post-operative pain. We educated the nurses in our recovery room to help with education and allow patients to anticipate that they would be going home. And then finally engaged the visiting nurses who work um, by visiting patients post-operatively to visit the patient on the day after surgery. And then the pandemic hit. And so COVID-19 um, obviously was a challenge for us in March, 2020, but it sure helped my research because if you were to have an operation during that time period, it was only if you could go home. There were not a lot of beds available in the hospital. Um, and so it allowed us to continue to do the good work and take care of patients with breast cancer um, you know, without, with ease. And so during March, 2020, we had 15 patients who were discharged same day. The mean operative time was about three hours, which include both the mastectomy and the reconstruction. And they remained in the recovery room for about five hours. We realized no post-operative complications, infection or hematoma in the first 30 days and quickly published our experience for Mass General, which was then adapted in an executive summary that was used across the country because we wanted to allow patients and those who may have experienced the crisis of the pandemic later than March, 2020, to be able to again, continue to treat their breast cancer. Um, and so I'm proud to report that we are assembling our one-year follow-up and we've been doing this as you know, now for about a year. And there have been 212 patients who were discharged same day since March, 2020 at MGH. We have patient satisfaction um, surveys that demonstrate really fantastic results. Um, 
So this is one of um, the good stories of the pandemic, and we have others that we can share that we learned in the Breast Center. Um, but I think this would be a great opportunity to turn it over to um, you all um, to be able to ask us, us questions. Thanks again, Leif and Connie, for collaborating on this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Specht and Dr. Lehman. That was really uh, exciting uh, and informative. Um, we do have some questions that are coming in. And again, um, anybody feel free to um, type questions into the Q&A. You can type them anonymously and we'll be able to see them and address them. I think, you know, uh, Michelle, you gave us such a nice example of how changes in practice can help us adapt to situations like the COVID pandemic, even though they're so rare, but the um, you know, lasting benefits of the adaptations that we make. So maybe Connie, I will kind of frame the same question to you in terms of what lessons did we take uh, as the pandemic is starting to ease up? What lessons did we learn to go forward in the area of breast cancer screening from the pandemic? You know, it was uh, it was just as Michelle said, the pandemic opened our eyes in so many ways to processes that needed to be improved all along. But wow, did it come in sharp focus with the pandemic. It also revealed how quickly in the healthcare industry and at Mass General, we were able to adapt to a completely unprecedented um, time. So what one of the things that we did in breast imaging is we um, First of all, we had to adjust to a new way to social distance and to take care of our patients. And then it was in the spring, um, right after you know we were right into the pandemic, where both the governor and then the um, and Klebanski said we need to stop uh, screening because we really need to have preserve all of these um, you know resources for really sick patients in a, a really dire situation. So across the country, screening shut down for about two to three months, and then we reopened. We are studying that so carefully. We've, we're studying what has happened and the impact is gonna be with us for a while. So when we reopened, we did a few things. We said, just as Michelle was saying, you know, people are gonna come in and they need to leave. They need to come in and get out. So rather than batch reading our screening mammograms and sending the woman a letter, and if she needed more workup coming back in a few days later and having a whole nother round of exposures and risk both to the patient and the technologist, we instituted an immediate read screen. So a time of visit, and we set it up in a way to preserve all the benefits of protected batch read screening. So every woman um, during our regular business hours, eight to 4.30 would have the result of their mammogram. If, if in fact the radiologist saw something that needed to be worked up, we would work that up then. We had an immediate read, screening, same day diag, and same day biopsy. That's a program that we're going to continue. There's no reason to stop doing that. It's good for our patients. Um, our patients love it. It's better for the institution. It preserves resources. And, um, and the radiologists, we've studied this carefully. We've shown that our performance, our ability to find cancers, our recall rates, those are exactly the same as when we were batch reading. We actually just presented this at ASCO. And one of the things that we were really excited about was we found that this had a dramatic improvement specifically on our patient populations that we tend to think of as more vulnerable. So our, our patients of color, um, our Hispanic patients and our African-American patients before we were doing the immediate reading. If you happen to be one of those lucky people that had a same day diagnostic, highly more likely, in fact, almost three times as likely that you were a higher SES in white. But after we just changed our workflow, that completely went away. And, um, and we're really excited about that. We've seen, seen that in many different domains where we can just change the institutional process, the workflow, and provide equitable, accessible care to all our patients. I think and that's... I'm super proud to add the fact that we also, again, in a collaborative way, created a doc of the day. So literally a patient would come, and this is a program that we're continuing, get their mammogram if they needed a diagnostic imaging, if they needed a biopsy, and then be able to meet a surgeon. So they had a face for that person who would call them if they had a cancer diagnosis. And so again, it's something that we should have been doing all along, um, but we're excited that we'll be able to continue that in the future. Yeah, I think this is so important, and particularly this idea 
of um, using precious resources more efficiently so that we can deliver more care to patients. And I think, you know, one example from the medical oncology uh, perspective is that, you know, um, in, in many busy hospitals, space is the limited resource. We can't see as many patients who might need to be seen in as timely a way as possible. And it turns out that the adaptation to doing a subset of visits as virtual visits um, turned out to be an efficient way to meet the needs of patients and to allow us not to uh, run out uh, of space um, and to maximize the efficiency of the time and the care delivery. And so it's another way where we did very little virtual visits before the pandemic, but it turns out the proportion that we're going to do going forward is much greater in the right circumstance because it's convenient for patients. It allows us to see more patients uh, in a more efficient way so that we can give them the proper treatment and counsel uh, that they need. So I think all of it um, is an interesting sidelight and benefit from being able to adapt um, to something uh, as substantial as the pandemic. Um, uh, one of the participants has a good question uh, for Connie. Uh, and the question is, um, what I'll paraphrase, what do you envision as the timeline for clinical implementation so that the, the mammograms can be read into the AI system and patients can actually get the results out? Um, huge project for us to build the infrastructure, but it, it has been built. And mammograms are obtained at any of our six centers, six screening centers within Mass General are run through this model. So um, now here's, here's the question that most of our patients ask them, well, like what's my AI risk score if they've had their mammogram? And this is where we are. If you've had a mammogram since September of 2017, we do have within our system, your, based on the information you've provided us at the time of your exam, your traditional risk scores, such as the tire acoustic um, score and your NCI score, your bracket, uh, pro score. And we also have the mammogram generated artificial intelligence five-year risk score. And we have yet, we're, we're literally in the process of how to share that information, how to partner with Leaf and Michelle and primary care docs on how this information is shared. We're right in that, that process. But if whoever is asking was just interested because you know, you're part of the mass general breast imaging community, we have on a one-by-one -one been and happy, and I'd be happy if you email me to review your mammogram, you know, look at the risk scores, and if there's any indication that you might benefit from more discussion with someone in the domain of um, risk assessment and counseling, we'd be, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. As far as it going totally live, uh, there's so many different aspects to it that we are working on, but we really hope the coming year is that, is that time. And that's going to be very exciting. And I think particularly the idea that it can be rolled out across the entire network of the MGB system, I think is particularly exciting. Um, another question related to the screening is something I'm always interested in as well. What about uh, the types of breast cancers that are more difficult to detect, such as lobular cancers? Do you think that AI will um, improve our ability to detect, detect these and at an earlier stage as well? I love that question. It's so critical. And we that is why... We are unbelievably excited about this enormous database we have at Mass General with AI values going way back to 2009. So one of the things you want in the um, deep learning and AI world is large, large volumes. And of course, our, um, our uh, ductal carcinomas are going to be much more common than our lobulars, but we feel by going back to 2009 in this large database, we're starting to get the power and the volumes that we need to ask those questions. We know that it's significantly better in predicting any future cancer, and we'd like to drill down and look more carefully is how is it in predicting lobulars versus ductal carcinoma in situ versus our you know, ER positive or ER negative cancer. So great question, and we're working very hard in that domain. Um, so another question that's come up, um, is how do we deal with, this is you know, a, 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 an issue that all of us deal with in the risk assessment community, women who have had a breast cancer and um, assessing their risk because many of the models that were developed don't apply to women who have already had an index breast cancer. And unfortunately these days, most women who develop breast cancer are cured of that breast cancer. Um, and um, what, what would you say about our ability going forward to uh, improve risk assessment for those women? 
Well, this is one of the things that I was really excited about because we decided to build our model on the full population of women um, that we saw for screening mammography, including women with a personal history. So we have assessed the power of our AI model to predict future cancers, whether you have a personal history or not. And it was really interesting because of course, then when we were comparing the tire acoustic, the Gale model, um, other models that we had, they all exclude patients with a personal history. So we've been able to look at this in a lot of different ways. And in some ways, predicting a future you know, breast cancer event I'm um, in a patient with personal history is looking at like what's what's the chance that there'll be another another cancer event, whether it's a you know labeled a recurrence or another breast cancer event. And and our model is um, works very well in that domain. So we're we're excited about that too. It, I I think actually the computer vision detects that the patient has had you know a lumpectomy with radiation, and that goes into the model because that uh, the rate of cancers we have in our women with a personal history of breast cancer is higher than the rate of uh, cancers screening women without a personal history. Thank you. And so another question that's come in is, is um, what is the guidance in general about folks who have a family history of breast cancer? It's often a confusing topic. And so as the uh, clinical director of breast ovarian cancer genetics, maybe I'll take one minute to answer that one. Breast cancer, of course, is a common disease in our society, so many women do have a family history of breast cancer. If one wants to talk about what are the elements of family history that really uh, you know, need to be paid attention to, breast cancers uh, in family members who are closer, you know, uh, uh, sisters, mothers, so forth, are more important than those that are more distant. Um, particularly, the age at which a, which a breast cancer occurs is um, inversely proportional to its risk of being associated with a hereditary risk. So the younger a breast cancer occurs, the more likely it could be associated with hereditary risk. Clearly multiple breast cancers, particularly on the same side, the mother's side or the father's side, um, is potentially a hallmark of some familial risk. And we're also learning that ovarian cancer in the family uh, is linked to breast cancer risk in some families. Other particular risk factors, such as those who are Ashkenazi Jewish, have in general a higher risk of having uh, inherited breast cancer genes. So breast cancer history in someone who's Ashkenazi Jewish um, is also um, something to pay attention to. These are important things to discuss with primary care doctors. Sometimes primary care doctors in their busy practices are not um, fully able to discuss the elements or be aware of the elements of your family history. So one of the things I tell everyone is, uh, bring up your family history to your primary care doctor when you see them and um, ask them whether they think that this is something that needs further evaluation. It's a rapidly evolving area and one that it's all uh, important for us all to be uh, aware of. Um, so um, one other thing I think that, that comes up is, you know, in the big picture, as we're talking about all these advances, um, what are the ones that you see making the biggest impact in the next decade? And I'll take just one moment to talk about the 25 years I've been at Mass General. And when I started here in, as a breast cancer oncologist, you know, we didn't have digital mammography. We didn't have MRI. Um, few women were getting uh, breast preser for preservation. There was no skin sparing surgery. All these advances that have come, and many of them through uh, the research done at Mesh General, that have transformed the way we care for breast cancer. So going forward, and I'll start with uh, Michelle, what do you see in the next 10 or more years about what the exciting advances in the surgical management of breast cancer will be? Well, I always like to pride myself. One of my mentors said, you know, never be the surgeon that always does surgery, just like you never want to be the barber that always gives a haircut. And so, you know, I really am excited and certainly collaborations with you and Connie have outlined this um, to not have to bring someone to the operating room. Um, one small project that Connie and I did was we looked at patients and you'll remember this leaf that there were a lot of women who got benign biopsies in the operating room. And again, with the advent of amazing imaging, um, percutaneous devices, and an understanding that when someone is found to have a breast abnormality, maybe we don't need to take it out. There's not a cancer associated with it. And Connie and I have a slide that demonstrates kind of a proportional 
inversion of the number of surgeries performed goes down when the percutaneous biopsies go up. So that's really an exciting realm. I also think that given your work as a medical oncologist and the exciting new drugs that we have that are having the ability to be given preoperatively before surgery and kill all the tumor cells and result in what we call a complete pathologic response. I'm just hopeful to the day that we'll be able to discover that complete pathologic response with a novel imaging device such as optical imaging, um, as opposed to having to take someone to the operating room, remove the tissue and confirm that there's truly no cancer left over. Um, so those are the two areas that I really am the most enthusiastic about. Don't tell my children who need to have their college education paid for because um, I'll have to pivot <laughs> if I'm not operating. Understood. Connie, what would you say? Yeah, um, I, I really think I'm so excited that we in the next few years have an opportunity to shift from age-based screening to risk-based screening. Um, that has so limited the impact of mammography by continuing to be in this very limited age-based screening domain. We can be smarter about how we develop personalized plans for every woman on what really is the right imaging for her to start at you know, 40 or 45, to have it every year, every two years. Would she benefit from screening ultrasound? What about MRI? I'm also really excited about some new technology that we're now offering at Mass General. Um, the technology explosion of the past 20 years in breast imaging was very, very exciting. But we're now shifting a bit to say, when do we use this? We've developed this amazing digital tomosynthesis and advanced breast MRI, but when and how do we use it best in each unique patient? And is it possible that we could replace, for a lot of women, a need for contrast-enhanced MRI with contrast-enhanced mammography? It is more accessible for almost all women and it's gonna be more comfortable. We're just really excited about that clinical research that, that we're starting now um, at the center. I think that's fantastic. And I think the um, one thing that I would say relates to another question that came in. And the question is, um, after breast cancer surgery in women diagnosed with primary breast cancer, we often do a test for hormone receptor positive cancers called an oncotype test, which is actually a test of the tumor itself that helps us guide the therapy decision for that woman, particularly around chemotherapy. And the really good question that comes up is, does a test like that tell us anything about future uh, risk or decisions uh, beyond treatment of the initial tumor? Um, and it's an excellent question. It turns out that this is a really exciting, evolving area. The Oncotype test itself was specially uh, developed for this decision about whether chemotherapy is helpful in the management of an uh, index breast cancer that occurs. But it turns out that analogous types of tests that are being developed, both of the tumor and potentially even of circulating tumor cells in the blood might be risk markers going forward. And what the studies that are ongoing seek to do is potentially to combine the imaging that is done with a blood-based test to help guide decisions about whether a cancer may be present or whether there may be risk of cancer in the future. And this is an extremely exciting area based on new technologies for uh, particularly DNA analysis in the blood, which allows us to detect at the earliest stages and even potentially uh, in the future um, uh, predict. So I think it's a very exciting area of tumor testing and blood testing for risk for early detection. Um, and um, I think it's going to be an exciting area. And again, another one um, with collaboration. I don't know if Connie, you wanted to discuss any of that that's going on. I, I absolutely agree. It's just been amazing. You know, we used to really be limited by the computers that we had on just how much information can we take in. We were sort of like just completely overloaded with information. And now we don't have those limitations. So how can we um, take all of the data that's collected from the imaging, from the blood, from the, from the tissue itself and predict the future and then be very targeted in our therapies for the future. And the databases that we have are so amazing. It's been fantastic. One of the collaborative trials we've had is to, for every patient that comes in for a breast biopsy um, at Mass General, we ask if they would be um, willing after we take their clinical biopsy and the area is numb to take two pieces out that we can put into a bank. And this is both, it's benign lesions, it's lesions we don't know yet what the outcome is. 
And that is so exciting. People, I, the, the uptake rate, the acceptance rate, the enthusiasm by patients is so high. And the data that we have, that is what guides our future. Um, that is where we just have so much information that we can assess and then develop new, new paradigms and new processes, not just for the you know, risk assessment prevention and early detection, but also for treatment. And then getting patients back into a, the wellness of surveillance and continued health. Um, and you know, another good question that's come up uh, for Michelle is, we know we should be screened, but what would your simple and concise message to be, uh, would be for patients about, what do I need to do to maximize breast health other than be sure and get my screening? You know, right now it's what I um, outlined previously. You know, every patient that we see in the office, we really try to emphasize the importance of, um, you know, trying to get to a normal body mass index. And it's not easy, you know, so we wanna work in a collaborative nation, nature such that our center becomes very comprehensive. Um, we wanna make sure that you're exercising, you know, and I think that's another benefit of the pandemic. You know, I think people are getting outside and realizing that sitting at a desk is maybe not the best for our overall health. So that's been a, another fabulous benefit. And then of course, as I reiterated the, the minimizing alcohol um, considering stopping hormone replacement therapy when you're uh, postmenopausal um, is another important realm. Um, it's what we got so far, but we're doing so much research. I'm sure we'll learn more in a short fashion. That's exactly right. So we're down to the last couple minutes. So I thought I would just close by um, saying that I hope that those of you who were able to join us are able to see and we were able to convey how excited we are all to be working here in this great healthcare institution where Mass General is really at a hub of innovation, surrounded by great academics, but most importantly, a place where we can practice medicine and care for patients um, in the best manner possible, while at the same time um, advancing care uh, for the current patients and the next generation of patients. And one theme that you might have picked up throughout this is all the research that's going on. And I can tell you without a doubt that every element of the research that you've heard about, um, philanthropies played some role in it. Um, you know, research funding is what we spend a lot of our time trying to generate in order to make these advances. And so we're always grateful for the support of our community uh, and our uh, patients to help the advances move more quickly uh, and efficiently because it's a place like Mass General where we're so poised to take advantage of everything that we have available in terms of science and technology to improve care uh, for everyone uh, across the globe, across the nation. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, session of our um, breast cancer uh, um, sorry, out of our breast cancer new strategies. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.